This uh, reading we just heard from Charles has um, uh, a verse in it that uh, a friend of mine and I now call the graduation card verse. Um, it's on lots of graduation cards for high school grads. If, you're, if you go to a religious section of cards for graduations, you will find a card, at least one, that has this verse in it. Um, verse 11 in the reading for today, for surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm to give you a future with hope. Right? That sounds like a graduation card, right? Um, we're going to talk about this verse, but let's put it into context of, of where this is coming from. Um, this is the prophet Jeremiah who is, uh, is writing at this point. And we need to know a bit about Jeremiah's context of when he was writing, what was going on. So the people of Israel were in exile in Babylon at this point. And it was early in the exile. So what had happened was Babylon, the, basically the world's superpower at that time, had come and invaded Israel and carried off a whole bunch of people uh, back to their homeland. Um, some might have been in slavery. Others might have just been, you know, this is where you've got to live now. You're going to work. You're going to be in our economy, all of that kind of thing. Um, some would have been elites who would have had a fair amount of freedom, but still were away from home. So you have God's people who are now living away from their homeland and... Uh, this comes from a time where it's fairly early on. They've only just gotten there. So they're feeling the pain of this happening. They're probably feeling the pain of loved ones who have actually been killed because there's, a, there's conflict involved, right? It's not just that. It's, a, it's also a hard road. It's not like they had like luxury camels that were taking them back to Babylon. Uh, probably had to walk. Um, it was difficult. They're in unfamiliar territory. It's really tough. Um, there's another prophet that shows up in the book of Jeremiah. There's actually a number of prophets, but the one I'm going to talk about is Hananiah. Hananiah is in the previous chapter, the one that we just heard. And Hananiah delivers good news. Hananiah delivers news that everyone wants to hear. Essentially, Hananiah's news to all of the people is, this exile, two years, tops. Don't worry about it. God has broken the yoke of Babylon, is, is what uh, Hananiah says. Essentially, God has already defeated Babylon, even if it doesn't look that way. I'm a prophet. Listen to me. It's over. We're going to be heading back. Everything's fine. News that everybody wants to hear. News that we can probably all relate to in today's situation as well, where we have leaders who will stand up and say, hey, it's over now. Like, we can, we're going to be okay. Um, no, no problem. Uh, so not necessarily direct parallels, but we can sort of understand the feelings of the people who are in exile, kind of like, oh, our whole lives have been turned upside down, and wow, we just want good news, someone to tell us, it's over now, let's get back to our normal life, let's go back home, it'll be great. That's Hananiah, that's the news that Hananiah delivers. Uh, incidentally, within seven months of him delivering that news, he drops dead. Um, and Jeremiah explains that the news that he delivered was completely wrong. Uh, the exile is going to last 70 years. Uh, is, is Jeremiah delivers that news in his letter. So that the little bit that we hear, or that we heard Charles read out for us, is actually a letter that Jeremiah writes to his community, to the exiles. And this letter is written... And God told him to write the letter, gave him what to say. And it's basically, yes, this exile is going to last a long time. Um, and, and it gives them things to do. So we'll come to those things to do in a minute. Now, I think when we read this section of Jeremiah, it says things about, you know, uh, get married and build houses and plant gardens and... Um, pray for the welfare of the city, and it's got this beautiful verse about, you know the plans I have for you, plans for welfare and a future with hope. I think if we read, just read it, 
We read the letter, I think, as good news, as celebratory, as, oh, isn't that great? You know, yeah, letter of encouragement. Buy some houses and plant some vineyards. But I actually don't think the people would have heard it as particularly celebratory, especially as, you know, seven months earlier, they had Hananiah with much better news. Let's just go home. That's way better news. Uh, when I was in Vancouver studying theology in Vancouver, I remember my first week of school. So it's the first time I've ever been away from uh, my home here in Winnipeg. And the first week of school, we did a lot of getting to know one another. These were people we were going to be studying together for a few years in a small community. And we had a course that was a short course on transitions and the importance of transitions and making a transition from one part of your life to another part of your life. And honestly, um, I ignored the course because I decided I don't really want to transition. I want to come to seminary, get, it, get my degree, be done, and uh, I don't want to put down roots here in, in Vancouver. Ideally, I want to go back to Manitoba. I love Manitoba. I want to be here. And that's actually what happened. It ended up taking me five years. I ended up putting down a little more roots than I thought I would because it's really hard to live somewhere five years without actually making some connections, even if they're accidental with people. But if I had gotten this kind of letter that said, no, 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 it's not going to be three-year degree in Vancouver. You're going to be here for 12 years or 15 years. So you better start putting down some roots and making some connections with people. I would have heard that as the worst news ever. I would not have heard that as, oh, great, buy a house, particularly in Vancouver. Um, housing prices are pretty expensive. So I just kind of ignored the transition. It caught up to me a few years later, and I realized, oh, right, you know, maybe I should enjoy my time here and go on some hikes. And, um, you know, I ended up getting married to Cheryl in the midst of my time there, and she moved out to Vancouver, and that really helped to actually enjoy uh, the, the life that was there in Vancouver to uh, to really participate, but probably for the first 18 months ago I, or so, I had my head a bit buried in the sand, just kind of trying to ignore the fact that I had transitioned from one place to another. And this letter from Jeremiah invites us actually to embrace the new realities in which we find ourselves. And how do we do that? There is what we might call a missional subtext to this letter. Um, and here's what I mean, is that our calling our calling in life as Christians is actually to the place in which we find ourselves. So certainly there are some who are called as missionaries to go off somewhere else, but primarily our calling is to the place where we're located, where we are, where we find ourselves. We are located people, and that's really important. And it seems strange to say that because obviously we're located people, we, like here we are, right? But it's important because in a lot of ways, Christianity has sort of taught that we're dislocated people, right? And we need to undo some of that. A lot of Christianity has actually taught that our true home is in heaven. Have we heard this before? Our true home is in heaven and that God will bring us home one day. And that our job is just to believe and be faithful and just kind of hang on until that time when we're called home. Right? Our true home is not here. And you might be able to find some places in the Bible that support that, but I'm just going to say right here, first of all, no. That's actually wrong. It's not really fully biblical, even if you can find a couple of proof texts. Our true home as human beings is on earth. I mean, you can read Genesis. God creates us, and right even out of the dirt, God creates Adam. Our true home is is the earth. Our true home is where we are. And the truly biblical story is that one day God will renew the heavens and the earth. Have we heard this as well? Yes, we've heard this, right? And that one day will, God will come and make a home with us here again and sort of restore that Garden of Eden where God walked with the man and the woman in the garden next to one another. God will come and live with us. This is 
really clear in the book of Revelation where it talks about God renewing the heavens and the earth and he will come and make his home with us here on earth. And in the meantime, we're not called to just hang on until that time or hang on until we'll be released to go to our true home. No, no, no. We're, we're called to live in such a way that anticipates the reality that God is going to renew all things. So let's live as though that's coming. We're called to live into that kind of reality. Christians and churches are often set up to behave as though our hope is that we will be in one big worship service one day in heaven and we'll get out of this. And that for now, our goal as Christians is to figure out, well, how do we get more people into our worship services now? Like, how do we do that? How do we get more people to come in here, into our buildings, support our budgets? And our framing of hope has often been to then place the church at the center of things, like church as organization at the center of things, not even necessarily church as people of God. We've often framed our hope in that way as Christians. I hope we can get back to those days when we had full churches. But that is not the Christian hope. Our reason for being is actually to be in and for the neighborhood, be in and for the lives of actual people out there in the world, in our lives. Our vocation is to love one another. We might have heard that somewhere before as well, to love our neighbors, not to hang on hoping that we will one day get released, and that's for me only. No, our calling is to love our neighbors here and now, to support, to encourage, and yes, even to help people see that this God of grace is actually the primary actor in it all. Now, Jeremiah gives the people that he's writing to, he gives them a spiritual practice. He gives them something to do. Build houses, live in them, plant gardens, and eat what they produce. Get married. Marry off your kids. And he says, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. The good news that everyone wants is exile is over. Time to go home. But Jeremiah gives them what sounds like not really great news, but it's actually good news for more people. It's actually good news for the Babylonians. Strangely, work for the prosperity of the people who captured you is what he's saying. Marry them, is what he's saying. Get involved in their lives. Participate in their economy, not rebuild yours. Does does Jeremiah say this because it's actually the best uh, strategy for survival of God's people? Like, let's just do this because otherwise we're not going to survive and then eventually we'll go home. I don't actually think that that is what is really going on here. I think actually this word comes to the exiles at this time. I think it comes to them because God also loves the Babylonians. And God is going to bless them through the loving actions of God's people. Seek the welfare of the city right where you are. And you notice then the focus shifts from the people of Israel and their well-being. Even though that's promised, that is not the focus. The focus is, is not anymore their hope for a return to home really quick or, or to normal for themselves. The focus is to this new environment, this new city, this new reality in which they find themselves. And it isn't even about figuring out, well, how can we make the Babylonians into Israelites? Like, can we convince them that they should become us? It isn't about that. It's actually about God's people simply inhabiting their new neighborhood in order to be neighbors. 
This is actually quite different than God's people waiting around for their time in heaven to, to start, you know, wishing that their sanctuaries were more full like they used to be, right? That's quite a bit different than that. Seek the welfare of the place you are in and the people who are right in front of you. Seek their welfare. The amazing thing about all of this is that God is actually at work in your neighborhood and at work among the people you already know. Um, We might find that God was actually at work amongst the Babylonians before the Israelites were even there. Suddenly they start to care for the well-being of their city and they discover, oh, the Holy Spirit is actually at work here. I think we find that too as you enter more deeply into the lives out there, you have occasions to see the Holy Spirit already at work. Um, We bought a car last year um, because our other one died. uh, And we ended up, as we were buying the car, we're talking to the salesman and my job as a minister came up. That usually comes up um, in things like when you're buying a car or buying a house because they need to know for loan applications and things like that, right? But anyway, it comes up um, about my job as a minister and I think he asked me something like, I don't fully remember the conversation, but I think he asked me something like, why, why did you want to be a minister? I thought, oh, that's a good question. And the first thing out of my mouth was, well, I believe that God is actually active in the world. And I was going to continue and say, so, so really, God called me to be a minister, right? I was trying to give a context for our understanding of being called. Right? So the first thing is, well, you've got to understand, I actually believe that God is active. God's doing things, and God does things like call people into vocations. But I couldn't even get in the second part of the sentence. So I, so I said, uh, I believe God is actually active in the world. And he sort of seemed excited and said, oh, me too, me too. I totally believe God is active, that God is doing things. And we ended up in this conversation about that. This is interesting. Here I am in a car dealership having this conversation about how there's lots of people who actually don't believe or don't think about the fact that God is actually doing things in the world. Sort of just think, God, if we believe in him at all, maybe just set things in motion and sort of sitting back going, wow, that's a mess. Oh, oh that one's good. Or, but we actually believe that God is active in the world. And notice I'm not saying God is active in the church. God is active in the church, sure, but not only. God is active in the lives of people in the world. Do we all really believe that? And if we do, if we do believe that God is actually active in the world, out there, One of the best spiritual practices we can do, one of the most important things we must do is to be on the lookout for God as we live out our call in for the neighborhood. In the end, it's not just about loving your neighbor. Like, we know that's important, right? Love God and love your neighbor. It's not just about that. There's something else, something more going on. It's it's not, often we frame it like this, that you come to church, you read your Bible, you take the Sabbath, you, um, you know, do things like centering prayer or pray, or you do all those things in order to renew your spirituality, right? Like in order to fill yourself up or to have God fill you but I'm the one doing those things so that I get filled and then I can serve others out of that. But we do that in the church, right? We have all this stuff that is meant to fill us in order to serve. But actually, God is in all of it. Right? It's not as though God is there filling you so that you can then go out there without God to serve others. No, God is in all of it. You'll meet the Spirit just as much, maybe even more, out there, serving neighbor. If anything, the interior practice 
been talking about throughout this series, like centering prayer, reading the Bible, remembering with grace and forgiveness and Sabbath, those are kind of interior practices. You know, some of them connect with others in community. But in a lot of ways, those are kind of internal, right? At, those practices are, are like training so that you are able to recognize God at work in the places you live and work. So you suddenly start to notice the Spirit's activity. And then we might realize that in the end, the graduation card verse, it's not just for the graduate, and it's certainly not just for the church. It's actually for all. Our work is to see where in our communities, among our friends, our families, and coworkers, that the promise of that verse is peeking through. Our work is to discern the activity of the Holy Spirit right in our lives and join in with it. And the promise will be for us as well. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Look for that happening in your neighborhood, amongst your friends, your family, your coworkers. Look for that. That is evidence of the Holy Spirit at work. Amen.